Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for that warm introduction there. Um, let's see. I think we'll just jump right in. Let me share my screen here. Uh, just want to get into present. There you go. Perfect. We see it. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So today, as probably alluded a little bit by my introduction, I want to get into the skinny on weight management. Sort of the reason my practice started was seeing a lot of patients in general GI practice that really had a lot of the same complaints really over and over again. Um, and seeing a lot of this information on the internet, on journal articles, newspapers, magazines, and knowing that patients were utterly confused. Um, and sort of being able to bundle that information down to be able to help patients in a sustainable way. So let's jump right in. So today we're going to talk about sort of what is obesity, um, the definition and prevalence, sort of the old ways of thinking about obesity, what those contributing factors are, how do we assess and what is the algorithm we try to go through to systematically be able to help and approach patients. Um, Anti-obesity pharmacology, which a lot of patients aren't familiar with, um, bariatric endoscopy, which even a lot of physicians aren't familiar with, and then the things we know about bariatric surgery and that multidisciplinary approach we employ as well. So obesity has finally been declared a disease state, right? Uh, we finally got a definition that's been approved as an actual disease and sort of what that definition that's been put together by the Obesity Medical Association is a chronic relapsing multifactorial neurobehavioral disease that promotes adipose tissue dysfunction and abnormal fat mass physical force that results in adverse metabolic, biochemical, and psychosocial health consequences. A very long and complicated definition, but exactly gives us an idea of just how difficult excess weight is. It is something that is chronic, why most patients will tell you they struggled with this their entire life or for a long period of time. Some patients, we also call it relapsing, uh, which in which that means somebody will do well for many, many years, and then they have a weight regain episode, and then they have to go back and work at it again. Multifactorial, meaning it can be caused by so many different things, many of which we'll get into today. Neurobehavioral, it affects your psyche, right? If patients feel shame, guilt, depression, anxiety, all of these things are associated with diet and food intake. We also have some um, an adipose tissue as a fat tissue dysfunction. We'll see sort of hormonal changes and sort of the hormonal sort of um, hormonal program uh, resistances that we can notice as well uh, with abnormal adipose tissue, um, abnormal forces, um, adverse metabolic and biochemical, and of course the psychosocial health consequences. So just to give you an idea, a complicated definition for a complicated disease process. And when we talk about prevalence, um, we talk, I like to start with talking to patients about sort of how we got here, um, what has been happening sort of just in the US first, we'll talk about it, then we'll talk about worldwide, worldwide. And so from this data here, you can see from 2000 to 2018, we've seen an increase in the prevalence of uh, patients being diagnosed with obesity and severe obesity. And this has gone up pretty steadily over the last couple of years. And this is what we've noticed sort of as being sort of one of our epidemics in in this country and around the world actually at this point. So we know this is something that is happening and the question is sort of how are we going to help patients with that and what are we going to do about it? And then we look at the share of adults when we start to think about what is happening globally around the world. And this is sort of taking a look at patients that are diagnosed with overweight or obesity. And from 1975 to 2016, in every single, most of all of these countries, you see their inclines, inclines, inclines over every single year in the proportion of patients that are diagnosed with these diseases. And when we look at things sort of globally from the changes from 2000 to 2016, it's pretty stark when you're able to look at it with, with colors. And so as you can see, sort of in the US, it was like 40, 50% back in 2000. And now you see 70% of that population. You see changes in South America, changes in Africa, changes throughout Europe. You see all of these changes that have differed and sort of those colors darkening on the right side of that screen. So sort of that's correlating to an increased proportion of patients diagnosed with overweight and obesity. So not only is it something that we're seeing in the United States, we're seeing this worldwide. 
And then we'll see sort of the definition, the patients with diagnosed with obesity. And so these are people with a BMI greater than 30. And we see the same thing. So the trend is still remains the same from 1975 to 2016, there being an increase in proportion and prevalence of patients diagnosed with obesity. And then when we look at obesity from 2000 to 2016, again, the same exact trend worldwide when those colors are darkening in color, which are sort of correlating to an increased percentage of the population being affected with these disease processes. And so what are these contributing factors is what we'll sort of grow, um, jump into now. Why are we seeing this worldwide? Why are we seeing this in the United States and throughout sort of the world? And it's sort of, um, sort of several different ideas of sort of why this has come about. Um, we have gone from sort of hunter gatherer mode to, you know, back when patients were mostly sat around the table, but there were so far less processed food to now things being very much convenience foods, junk foods, processed foods, a lot of fast food options that we have that are sort of for our to correlate with our lives that are sort of super busy. And then we have sort of sitting in very sedentary sort of jobs. And this is how it happened for a lot of my patients over the last two years with sort of going from commuting to work, being up and about to sort of sitting at home um, with COVID. And also we've seen a lot of conveniences too, right? So instead of walking in airports and some of these theme parks, you see walking, you know, walkways here, right? That are helping you move along. You don't even have to walk. You can just stand there. And also this is a, one of the hilarious images is that I saw is people even going to the gym will take the escalator rather than the stairs to go work out. So these are conveniences that we have seen around sort of happening in our country that sort of are maybe contributing factors. Other things we think about are sort of a, a multiple hit hypothesis. And so some of the things we talked about recently, you'll see in the left side of the screen here with the hunter gatherer. And then we sort of change to more agriculture and then more industrial food um, and then more processed foods as well. Um, and these sort of, we saw, these are sort of all insults that are happening to our microbiome, to the way we live our lives, to how much movement we have, how much access to food that we have um, and sort of the way sort of daily life and food intake happens. So you see sort of all of these sort of changes here, sort of in change, quality sort of changes in your microbiome and what's happening in your gut. So when your diet changes, you see a little bit of a decrease in your microbiome here. The more sanitation we have, we see a little bit more changes in your microbiome, the more we're washing our hands, the less we're outside in dirt and sort of farming and those sort of things. And then we have things that we needed that were great for sort of civilization like antibiotics, but these also changed your gut microbiome and how your body reacts to particular foods. Um, and then we have sort of processed foods, C-sections, formulas, all of these things that sort of also additionally change your microbiome and reduce that sort of the species and that diversity that you see in your microbiome. We've know through, you know, there's a lot we don't know about the microbiome, but we know that sort of having an increased diversity helps patients to be able to utilize energy better and to be able to utilize those calories that we're intaking to be able to use them more effectively. And so there's many, many different hits that we'll talk about today that sort of got us to this point. And my goal during this talk is to get patients and to sort of try to remove that stigma that we have around excess weight and sort of that blame game of, oh, it's your fault. You're eating too much and moving too little, but taking sort of a global take a, a perspective to look at sort of all of these other insults that have happened sort of globally around the world that can help and contribute to get us to this point. And so when I think about sort of the processed food, sort of in GI practice, I see a lot of patients with a lot of the similar symptoms um, with abdominal discomfort, bloating, um, all types of symptoms. And so my question was after the upper endoscopy is normal, the colonoscopy is normal, the stool studies are normal, the biopsies, all of the labs, all of the MRI, the ultrasound, the HIDA scan, all of these things are negative. My question of what prompted me to do a nutrition fellowship was to understand what is happening then. Why are 80% of my patients having all of these symptoms and why all of them have such problem difficulty with weight loss? What is that common thread? And the more I boiled down to it, that common thread seemed to be all of the convenience foods, all of the processed foods. And then I thought, well, what in the world are in those foods, right? What is causing these issues? And what makes food sort of processed? Um, and so that sort of is a, a term that sort of gets flushed out in data a little bit, but 
There's a difference between minimally processed and ultra processed. Um, but those things that are ultra processed foods, they have additives, which are another name for them are emulsifiers. And so the question for me was, so what did the, when did this all happen? And so the, there was an explosion of sort of emulsifiers over the years. Um, and initially they would have to go through a lot of testing with the FDA before they were approved so to be able to be, to be regarded as safe. Um, but then there was sort of this period of time that sort of lobbyists and companies recognized we really need these things. They are help, they're helpful in helping us to make cheap food, to make the shelf stable, to make foods more palatable, to make things prettier. So you'll notice in salad dressings or mayo, these things, they don't separate. They look prettier. These are emulsifiers and additives. That's why the things are able to sit on the shelf for a long period of time. That's why they're able to taste the same. You know, if you have something now in six months from now, it can taste the same in some of these foods. Um, but what was this doing to our actual gut? And so this picture on the right here is showing sort of what I see when I do a colonoscopy, for example, with somebody with inflammatory bowel disease, um, you can see sort of ulcerations or breaks in the colon. And these are sort of seen as sort of ulcers sometimes, right? But what is happening, and a lot of data has shown us with emulsifiers themselves, is they cause little tears in the small bowel, little bit of inflammation over time. And so what we've been seeing um, is that what can happen is you puts you at higher risk for metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome are things like um, high blood pressure, um, insulin resistance or diabetes, fatty liver disease, another name for that is hepatic steatosis. Um, and that sort of that general overall feeling of being unwell and sort of having excess weight as well. And so these are things that we see on a, very, a much smaller level than we see in a patient, for example, with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. But this made sense to sort of why we were seeing these patients with sort of these symptoms that we couldn't really put really in a box to know why they were having these symptoms. But clearly they were because we were seeing, we see droves of patients that come in that are all feeling pretty poorly and spending a lot of time in doctor's visits and doctor's appointments. And so we want to make sure that we're preserving that gut lumen. That gut lumen is only one cell thick to keep the environment from entering into sort of your bloodstream. And the goal there is to make sure we have a good microbiome that is being sort of fostered by fiber rich foods and whole foods to sort of keep that layer rather than sort of breaking that layer down and sort of um, causing those breaks in the mucosa. So let's talk a little bit now about sort of taking all of that information and figuring out what happens clinically. What do we see in actual practice? And so excess weight causes and wrecks havoc on literally every portion of the body. Me as a gastroenterologist, I see reflux. I see esophageal cancer. I see colon polyps, which sometimes can lead to colon cancer. We see fatty liver disease. Over time, fatty liver disease without treatment, which is just weight loss, we see that turn to fibrosis, which is scarring of the liver. And over time, that scarring of the liver becomes cirrhosis. Fatty liver is now becoming one of the very, the main issues and main reasons patients are getting liver transplants in this country. So no longer alcohol and hep C, but now from fatty liver disease that has gotten worse over the years, which is something that is treatable with weight loss, um, cirrhosis. Uh, liver cancer. Once a patient has cirrhosis, they're at higher risk for liver cancer, which is why we screen those patients every six months. Um, so that's another risk once somebody has cirrhosis. Um, gallstones. We have a lot of patients that have had their gallbladders removed, but also other things that can happen is stones can come out and get stuck in that duct and cause you to have sort of an inflammatory sort of event called cholecholecholithiasis that uh, cholecholecholithiasis that can make us have to go in and sort of take those stones out of that duct. So that's another procedure a patient may have to have or gallbladder cancer, um, pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer. So there's many, many things that can happen. And this is just in the GI tract. But think about sort of everything else, the neurological um, components with headaches and strokes um, and issues with diabetic retinopathy. So issues with your vision, respiratory. People, for example, will have sleep apnea, then poor sleep. Sleep apnea can also lead to high blood pressure that being, that being uncontrolled. Um, many types of cancers as well. Also high blood pressure, we know about heart attacks and high cholesterol and clotting. Um, every, a lot of people will notice the joint pains with arthritis um, and back pains, which lead people to not move around as much. And then there's more um, sedent, uh, have sedentary lifestyle. Um, the psychological piece we've talked about with depression, anxiety, and then causing more eating disorders with emotional eating at that point. I'm a lot of nutritional deficiencies, and we know there's a lot of reproductive problems as well that can happen and occur in the setting of excess weight. 
And so the question that I get from so many of my patients is, you know, but what is it? It must be my fault. I'm told that I would feel better if I would just lose weight. And I am told by my doctor that, you know, I would, wouldn't have joint pain, wouldn't have to worry about any of these things if I would just go lose weight. And the onus is on me to just figure it out and do it. However, it's actually not quite that simple. Um, it's not as as simple as sort of that old dogma, that old thought that we had of just simply eating less and moving more. With more data and more research over the years, we've been able to determine that it's actually a lot more complicated and that physiology of weight is more complicated than that, as we alluded to that definition we gave in the very beginning. And so I like to start with my patients of, because everybody is really obsessed with sort of caloric intake, right? And everybody wants to keep up with how much they're taking in and everybody. So that's the only thing on the packages that people pay attention to is the calories. And so when I ask a patient, what is a calorie? I, most of them cannot tell me what the calorie is and where that even, where it even came from or how, um, how consistent it is or how, and how it affects their bodies. And so the, the word calorie itself, there's a lot of sort of, conflict on who coined the term. And so in the 1800s about um, several different um, sciences that have been said to sort of have been able to coin the, the phrase, but what it is, is the amount of heat needed to raise uh, any particle of food, um, one kilogram of water, the temperature, one from zero to one degree Celsius. Um, and that is sort of what a calorie is, right? So being put inside this, this chamber for food and seeing how much it would take to raise that temperature. And as you can see that we are not sort of closed structures, we're not closed chambers. Um, there's many, many variations. There's genes and epigenetics and losses with sweat and stool and urine. Um, there's stressors, there's, uh, there's how we process food, there are medications we may be on, there's how much mobility. There are many different variations and reasons in which that would not sort of uh, correlate to us specifically for every single thing. So every calorie, a calorie just isn't a calorie and a calorie is not equal across all patients or all people. And so how it was determined in like 1800s was um, the by Atwater determined the average number of calories um, and fat was nine calories per gram and carbohydrates was four calories per gram and protein also four calories per gram. So this is sort of where this came from. So I like to give people idea before they start harping on how their caloric intake. So just take a moment to give themselves a little bit of grace just to think about what is a calorie and why is that important to you and sort of how does that correlate to you in your body? So a little bit of, instead of, you know, we, I try to go a little bit beyond just sort of caloric intake and I might wear a BMI in general, because we know BMI is sort of not a great measurement of sort of a patient's overall health. Um, so we want to make sure we take into account sort of everything as we're thinking about the total patient. And so we look at body composition and this gives us more information. This gives us information on the percent fat, the bone, the percent of water, the percent of muscle. And it gives us a better understanding of each particular patient. Some people may have a little bit more muscle and BMI doesn't account for that. You have a higher BMI and be classified as having obesity, but technically that weight is in the setting of muscle. Some of my patients have excess water. So patients that have heart disease, like heart failure, or patients who have kidney disease or are on dialysis, um, patients that have liver disease with a lot of fluid Anocytes. These are all patients that have excess water weight, but your body, but BMI doesn't take that into account. It takes into account, you know, nothing. So there's several different ways to sort of determine body composition. The gold standard is sort of a DEXA scan, which is what you see here. So it's able to sort of figure out and delineate those things for us. But most people won't have that done, right? Because it's sort of an expensive way to determine sort of your percent fat, bone, water, and muscle. Other ways um, are also pretty sort of uh, hard to come by. One of them is called an indirect calorimeter. And this is something I did during my nutrition fellowship actually, um, but it takes a, a lot of things into account. It's only at specialized centers. And so not something that is um, efficient enough to be able to do sort of an everyday life. Um, you have to be very still. It, measure, it matters what you've eaten, what you've been doing before. Um, so there's a lot of things that sort of correlate to that. And so this gives you an understanding, though, of exactly your predicted sort of energy expenditure every single day. So how much it takes to run your body every single day. 
um, and sort of what that prediction is. And that sort of gives us an idea of sort of if patients want to lose or gain weight, sort of what they're about what their intake they should be aiming for. Um, and there are other things that we use as well to sort of do this one is called a bioimpedance study. And this is a little bit easier to come by. We have one of those in our clinic. That's what we see here on the left. And this is using sort of impedance to be able to determine and look at each portion of your body sort of separately. to so look at each of those compartments to determine what is happening in both legs, both arms um, and that trunk area as well to give us a better understanding of percent fat mass, visceral fat and skeletal muscle mass. And that's a ward of weight as well. And then we have the bot mod over to the right here, which is an air displacement test as well. And so some very high tech ways we're sort of able to use now to be able to give us an understanding and a little bit better of an idea um, about body mass index and body composition itself. And so when we're talking about sort of energy expenditure, what I like to use when after we're going through talking to our patients about portion control, serving sizes, sort of how much we're intaking every day, it's sort of trying to pull back from sort of how much emphasis we're putting on sort of caloric intake. I want people to sort of think about how we're all very different. I think um, in the, our country, sometimes we look at the label on the side of a box and it says 2000 calories, you know, that's how things are calculated for an intake of 2000 calories per day. And sort of, I use this bioimpedance study to show patients that most likely you are not burning 2000 calories a day, right? And so that's not what it takes to run your body every day, unless you're sort of an athlete or something. And so this is to give patients that understanding because if you are thinking that that's how much we're supposed to have every day and you reduce that to, you know, 1800 and you're sort of get frustrated because there's no weight loss. The problem is, is sort of where are we starting, right? And so this sort of calculation is able to give us what patients based on metabolic rate is. And so the one here is a little bit dark is 1399. So 1400. So for a person to lose weight, they would need to be underneath that, right? In a perfect world, if we're thinking a calorie is a calorie, but to give people sort of that general idea about daily intake. But also we talk a little bit about what that breakdown is. So what is that, that total energy expenditure? What is made up of that? And so the large part of that is that resting energy expenditure. And that's sort of what it takes to run your body every day. Those are things that we can't really alter a whole lot. Other two things we can alter a little bit, right? The thermic energy of food is like 10%. So I tell patients it's a little bit counterintuitive, but when you're eating, you're actually creating, you're actually burning energy as well, but you have to break that food down. So that's about 10%. And the other one um, is the EEPA, which is sort of how much you're moving around. So I'll ask patients to just get up and move around throughout the day. It doesn't have to be sort of a dedicated, you know, you say, oh, I can't work out today. I don't have time. So you just don't move at all. No, I give my patients, I want you to get up and just move around throughout the day. Some people will have, if you have a very sedentary job, sort of a standing desk or a treadmill desk, or just simply parking further away. Um, these are sort of ways, taking the stairs instead of the elevator. These are sort of easy and quick ways to sort of increase sort of how much of that physical activity you're getting to be able to burn. And I, you know, I want people to get out of the habit of thinking that it has to be this dedicated hardcore two hours of workout. And that's the only thing that matters. No, movement in general matters. And so getting people to think about that a little bit more is also very helpful. And then we sort of, as I talk to my patients a lot about, you know, everybody comes in about and talking about sort of fad diets and sort of the, how much uh, they should be having of carbs or protein or fat. And I think everybody demonizes carbs because of everything that's been in sort of data and news and oh my God, we can't have carbs, carbs are horrible. Well, we have to have some carbs, right? So these are things that are turned into glucose that we need for brain functioning, heart functioning. These are things that are actually pretty, we, we need them, they're useful. But we sort of look at sort of, you know, when we nerd out a little bit for our patients, we look at what is sort of the, the recommendation of sort of that, that those percentages per day. Um, and sort of seeing what end of those things that we should be on. Um, there's a lot of data and studies coming out about a little bit more imprecision medicine and sort of genes that will be able to give us a little bit more data on what would work for each particular person. But for right now, we have to sort of see what works for each person and sort of get within those ranges and sort of as we think about sort of how much people are getting in every day. And so as we talk more about those fad diets, um, there's a ton of them. Uh, <laughs> And I've heard, I hear more and more each day as patients come in and tell me sort of what is going on sort of out in the world, right? And so what I like to talk to patients about is sort of what is sustainable? What is something that is giving you overall good health? 
What is something that's making sure your cholesterol is well controlled, that you no longer have fatty liver, that your heartburn, you have no more heartburn symptoms, no bloating, you're having stools every day when you feel like you're completely empty, you're sleeping well, you have good energy, you're not having joint pains or any discomfort from sort of inflammation, your skin is clear, you're not having hair loss. Um, these are all signs of me of a well-rounded sort of nutrition. And I can tell you on some of these diets, I'll still I'll, I'll pick on keto because that's sort of been the, the craze recently. And sort of there's some really unhealthy ways of sort of doing keto, but I think people really love it because it, you know, it's a diet where people are told they can eat bacon. And so you have all of these patients that will be hardcore on a keto diet. And this confusing thing is there will be weight loss. And usually because you're reducing your caloric intake, but patients will notice when they have their labs done with their primary care doctor, that their cholesterol levels are through the roof. And that's because of sort of the changes in the ways you sort of kind of manipulated that diet a little bit there. So um, when we talk about sort of diets, my goal is to get people away from thinking about a diet and what you can't have and trying to think about things that are healthier versions of things that you like, thinking about reducing those sizes, thinking about sort of changing in the ratios of particular things to make sure people aren't hungry throughout the day and to make sure we're being able to sustain and make those healthier choices. Another confusing thing I think for people, as we talked about a little bit earlier, is exercise. So how much exercise is enough? And I think one of the things that was confused that was sort of shocking to me is sort of I did a little bit more data in getting board certified in obesity medicine was recognizing exactly how, to, how much exercise one needs for general health versus to prevent um, weight regain or sort of to prevent weight gain. And so, and I always joke with patients, I'll have patients that come in that say, oh my goodness, I work out for two hours. I do two sets twice a day for every, you know, every day except one, and I am just not losing weight. And the joke that my, uh, my fitness trainer says is that you can't outrun a bad diet, right? And so that is something that we, we talk about big time is sort of putting both of those things together, but also recognizing that you, there is something to be said about how much activity you're getting and sort of what your goals are. So it's a lot of exercise to prevent weight regain and to have that maintenance. But what we really want is sort of that to maintain that general health benefit, which is at least 150 minutes a week um, with some strength training as well. So I think getting patients to recognize how much activity they're getting, how much movement they're getting in general, doing that, doing those things safely, paying attention to sort of those heart rate goals and sort of what, what you're actually doing and what muscles you're hitting um, during those exercises as well. But I think it's sort of finding that balance. Um, I think people get into a habit of trying to work out really, really hard, but then they hate it. And then it turns people off from from exercise at all. So the goal is to find that sort of perfect spot so that people feel good while they're working out. You get that sort of serotonin and dopamine sort of release and you feel good afterwards. So trying to getting people to understand that it's not simply just how much exercise you're doing. And as we saw from that last slide, when it broke down the energy expenditure, it's not a huge part of sort of where you're gonna get a lot of bang for your buck, which is why it takes so much to sort of help move the needle there. And so, if we haven't alluded to already how complicated it is, I'm going to take you even beyond sort of all we just talked about to talk about sort of that pathophysiology of obesity. Now, this is a super busy slide, but we're going to break it down so it doesn't seem too overwhelming. So just from sort of uh, when we think about sort of hormones and what happens sort of when we eat and for appetite stimulation, appetite suppression and satiation. So there are several hormones that come from the stomach, the small bowel, the colon, the pancreas, and even fat cells. And these hormones sort of stimulate a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. Um, and that's where you have two different sort of pathways. One pathway will um, stimulate sort of um, a reduced appetite and one pathway will stimulate appetite, right? And so throughout all of these different hormones that are coming, you only have one hormone that is the one that stimulates appetite and that's ghrelin. Um, and ghrelin comes from the stomach. And so that is a hormone and all the rest of them are working in concert to help with reducing sort of act appetite. Um, and so that's sort of a, a thing that I talk to patients about big time when we talk about sort of things that sort of change ghrelin, change insulin, change leptin. Um, and one of the things that we, we know happens with weight loss, if whether that weight loss is from diet and exercise, pharmacologic therapy, or from bariatric surgery, we know that with weight loss, 
you may notice that you feel hungry and people think that they are, you know, their minds is playing tricks on them or, you know, it's all their fault. But what we notice is ghrelin levels increase after you lose weight. So it's sort of a mean trick, right? Where you notice that I've done all this work, I've reduced my, you know, caloric intake, I've gotten to this, this particular goal, I'm trying to get to my next goal, but now I'm more hungry. And that sort of is defeating for a lot of people and very frustrating. And so what we know is ghrelin levels increase. And so that's one of the things that we notice. Um, leptin is another hormone that is sort of protective that comes from fat, but we know that when there is too much, when there's excess fat, that you can get sort of a leptin resistance. But we can also see that in one of the genetic diseases as well that causes patients to have abnormal or excess weight. So there's a lot of things that we, we notice that are should be protective, but when there's too much on it, there becomes a resistance of it. So this is a side, it's really just to show that it's, again, beyond just how much you're intaking and how much you're moving. These are actually hormonal responses that are happening from several different organs that are affecting the arcuate nucleus in your brain to create sort of those responses that either help you to be satiated or to feel hungry. And so taking it beyond the pathophysiology, we also think about sort of the many, many other sort of contributors. And so we look at um, things like genetics, which we'll talk a little bit about later, epigenetics. And what we mean by epigenetics are um, other factors that sort of, if you have a particular genetic um, makeup, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will ex express that gene, right? You have to have something to manipulate it to make you express that gene. So it's like having a key to a lock, but you have to actually put the key in the lock and turn it to open a door. And that's what we mean by epigenetics. Um, there's a lot of other things like food marketing. There's no coincidence that, you know, you've seen all of these commercials and now you're in your car, you're passing by somewhere and you go, hmm, I have a, feel, a sort of an urge to have X. But that's because there have been some signaling that you haven't even paid attention to earlier in that day that it sort of made you decide, oh, I think I need to have Starbucks or I need to have, you know, some fast food thing. Also microbiome that we talked about earlier, several changes in the microbiome from different hits, whether it was you, you're raised in the country versus the city, whether you had a dog growing up, whether you had siblings, whether you played outside, whether your mom was around you and made you wash your hands all the time, or whether you just played in the dirt, um, whether you were born via C-section or vaginally, whether you were breastfed versus bottle fed, whether you were in the hospital a lot with a bunch of antibiotics, um, if you've had a cancer, had chemo, there's so many different things that, really, that change your microbiome. And so this is another factor. Sleep is also a big factor. So one of the things that we really harp on here too, is to make sure people are sleeping. So studies have shown us that patients that get between seven to nine hours of sleep every night are sort of in that sweet spot. So we know patients that sort of work overnight, sort of our shift workers, our nurses that work overnight, these are patients that usually will have some difficulty with some weight. Um, so trying to get patients to, you know, not sleep too little or not sleep too much. Um, and then behavior and habits. So we pick up habits sort of throughout our lives. And some things that I tell my patients that you don't think about um, are being told kind of throughout your life to finish your food, finish your plate, don't leave food on your plate. So these are habits that sort of become sort of ingrained in your life as you are an adult. You continue to do that same thing. So you don't listen to that trigger that has come from your brain to tell you you're satiated. You continue the behavior pattern that you were taught, which was finishing your plate. Um, also, the re reduced physical activity is a sort of a function of our world now, right? We don't have to go out and sort of actually physically get food. We are not sort of walking to work. We have these conveniences, but it sort of led to us having reduced physical activity. And then we'll talk a little bit about drug induced a little bit later. Um, and that's when sort of some medications that we may be on a big one I think of is I had a patient recently on prednisone, um, a steroid, which is a medication that can really sort of increase hunger and increase inflammation. Uh, well, not inflammation, increase sort of that, that hunger drive, um, cause some insomnia um, and can make people sort of just more hungry overall. Um, there's cultural changes. So some patients will say, well, this is just what we eat. We, we eat a lot of pasta. We, we eat a lot of pork. This is sort of a cultural thing for us. Um, then we think about endocrine um, disorders. So patients with PCOS, for example, is one that comes to mind. These are things that sort of affect your, your hormone level. Um, energy homeostasis disruption. So seeing sort of that increased sort of fatigue and brain fog and not wanting to move a whole lot. We think about prenatal exposure. So what is happening in utero? So that is also causing like effect on that unborn child, right? 
And then chemical exposures, a lot of those chemicals are sort of depending on where you live in a city, um, some of the foods that we're eating, um, and then stressors. That's the one big thing that my patients love to ignore, and it's sort of the amount of stress that we are under, sort of day in and day out. Um, stress was an evolutionary response to sort of help get you away from a problem. But now this is sort of chronic, whether it's from traffic in the morning, waking up early for a commute, rushing to get kids ready for school, um, being in a pandemic, um, let's see, dealing with particular coworkers that may be challenging, having a big talk that you have to do. These are all things that cause sort of chronic amounts of stress, which we don't recognize sort of contribute to sort of snacking um, and emotional eating at times too. So all of this information we have, what on earth do we do about it now? And so one of the things we like to look at is A, acknowledging and sort of stepping back and getting rid of some of that bias and recognizing obesity as a disease. Um, and then collecting all of that data of everything we just talked about. We sort of, it's a lot of data collection to sort of see where we are and where are we gonna start. Doing that evaluation and assessment so I'm able to figure out that family history, those medications, sort of how did you grow up? What is those cultural restraints? Um, what are those barriers that you may have? Um, what are your decision-making skills? Um, sort of how do you think about food throughout the day? Do you pack your food? Do you grocery shop? Do you have a particular place to eat or do you eat sort of in route on the car? Um, and then that motivational sort of interviewing where we talk about these interventions, the physical activity, the behavioral therapy, the pharmacologic therapy, and those procedures as well. So it's a lot that goes into something that people, you know, used to just sort of poo-poo off and say, nope, it's all your fault. So the goal is sort of to be able to use all of these things the same way we would do any other disease, any disease. Um, if you had high blood pressure, diabetes, or fatty liver disease, these are all things I'm going to talk about with my patients to sort of get you to a point to get you over those disease processes. And so I like to think of it of sort of a multi-pronged approach. It's not just one thing and not everything will work for everyone. So once somebody sort of is characterized or has a diagnosis of overweight or obesity, we start to think about lifestyle changes. We start talking to them about sort of what is happening in their life, what contributing to those factors and sort of how we can sort of create some changes that work within their lives. Um, we also will think about adding on pharmacologic therapy and which these are all things we're gonna talk about, bariatric endoscopy and then bariatric surgery as well. And so when I start with nutrition, I like to give patients information. When patients have more information, it's sort of just being able to know a little bit more. Once you know a little bit more, it's easier for you to sort of put those things into action. And so I try to change patients' expectations about living and what it means to age. And so I think in this country, a lot of us think that as you get over, is older is inevitable. Of course, I'll have high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes. I'm getting older, that's normal, right? And my goal is to get people to think that, no, that doesn't have to be your normal. Let's change that narrative. Let's change how we view aging in this country. And so I take a lot of those kind of thoughts and ideas from these blue zone populations. And blue zone populations are the highest concentration of patients that live to be age 100 or older around the world with reduced sort of uh, mor morbidity and mortality. And some of the things that we see that are very different is sort of the way they live life versus us in the US um, are dietary. So a lot of those are sort of increased fruits in servings of fruit per day, increased servings of whole um, grains per day and vegetables, and then reduced amounts of meat every day, right? And so in the US, it's multiple meats throughout the day. In these blue zone populations, you may get three to four meats per month. And so getting patients to sort of see those differences and shifts um, and sort of how there are changes that sort of can really contribute to how you live your life. Other things are sort of these patients being able to sort of um, spend time with their families. And so there are also some, usually some type of meditative practice as well. So it's a lot of sort of bonding and joy and love and sort of activity and movement. And so getting us in sort of in our population to add those things back in, to be able to slow down a bit and to think about what those gains will be down the line and sort of trying to prevent patients from having to spend all their time going to doctor's appointments when they get older. Instead, I want patients to be able to think about, oh, I would like to be able to continue to go out to dinner with my family, to, to be able to go to my grandkids' graduations and travel, to be able to enjoy life as we age rather than sort of spending that time in chronic pain or in chronic discomfort. And these blue zone populations give us a blueprint and show us this can be done um, with sort of adding in those things in which we're slowed down, in which we're sleeping, in which we're eating whole foods and reducing those processed foods, um, in which we're getting more sort of uh, meditative and sort of more purpose um, in life as well. 
So these are things I like to think about with my patients. And then sort of the data behind that. This was a really cool study that was done. So to back up there, it's sort of routinely very difficult to do nutrition studies because just like we talked about before, um, we're all very different in how we metabolize food. So it gives one person, two people, the exact same meal intake. And their bodies are going to process those things very differently based on all those things we talked about before, genetics, epigenetics, medications, microbiome, everything. But this study was sort of as close as we were going to get to be able to look at that. And so to be able to account for all of those things, these patients were in a, kept in an um, inpatient setting so they could measure and monitor everything. They were two weeks on a minimally processed diet and two weeks on an ultra processed diet. And these diets were matched for macronutrients um, and micronutrients. Um, and they weren't told to eat less or more, but they measured sort of how much people ate um, when they ate more and sort of how quickly they ate. And what they found is, in addition to sort of this data, the patients that were in when they were, and they did them as a crossover, so they would do two weeks of one thing, two weeks of the other. And so what they found was the patients that went from the minimally processed to the ultra processed, they tend to eat faster, which correlated to what we talked about other, earlier with those processed foods being sort of very palatable, which means they are easier to chew, they're usually softer, which correlates to you being able to eat, the, eat more of them. Um, they ate a little bit quicker as well, because there, if you think about it, it takes a little bit longer to chew an apple versus, you know, a potato chip. Um, and they also sort of, they found those patients ate more calories when they were on the ultra process versus the unprocessed. My joke to patients is if you try to sit and eat five apples, you won't be able to do it because of how much fiber you're going to get in that apple. Um, and they also found, so the things they found sort of that were pretty remarkable in sort of the labs itself are ghrelin, we talked about, right? And ghrelin is that hunger hormone. And we see that it's higher in that ultra processed versus the unprocessed diet. So what is ghrelin? It's a hunger hormone that makes you more hungry. Um, and then we saw insulin levels. Insulin is important because we don't want patients to have insulin resistance and start to have a diagnosis of pre-diabetes and then diabetes. In just that two week period, we saw patients that had an increased level um, number for insulin um, in the ultra process versus the unprocessed. And again, just in two weeks, we saw changes in total cholesterol and LDL um, and also CRP, which is at the bottom here, which you can't see real well, but that's an inflammatory marker, which we talked about with those emulsifiers causing those sort of uh, breaks in that mucosa. We see changes even in that CRP, which is that inflammatory marker. So this was sort of kind of gave us a nice glimpse of what processed food and emulsifiers do to your body sort of overall. We also saw increases in weight in just that two week period in patients that moved from the minimally processed to the ultra processed. And so this is sort of just more data that we're getting over and over again and get patients sort of to reduce that processed food. And then when we talk about sort of, we talk about trying to reduce all those things we talked about, uh, talked about before with those sort of metabolic consequences of excess weight. And we also of course wanna to come to reduce people's risk of cancer. And so the American Cancer Society guidelines from, I think they were last year, 2021, for physical activity and healthy eating patterns. And so we could talk for days about all the studies that have come out for eating patterns and Mediterranean diet versus plant-based versus vegan versus flexitarian. There's tons of data, but most of it boils down to a little of what you see by the American Cancer Society guidelines. We want patients to have a variety of vegetables, so multiple colors, you see dark green, red, orange, fiber rich, um, many different types of vegetables every day, legumes like beans and peas, um, more fruits and more whole fruits with a multitude of colors and whole grains. And we also want our patients to limit red and processed meats. For me as a gastroenterologist, I want them to reduce it because I know that increases your risk for colon cancer. Um, sugar sweetened beverages, because I know that increases patients' risk for fatty liver disease that ends up in cirrhosis down the line and diabetes. Um, and then highly processed foods and refined grain products. Again, going back to what we talked about before with those emulsifiers causing a lot of GI symptoms, but also being carcinogenic um, from the American Cancer Society guidelines. And so this is sort of that general guideline that we'll see from sort of most studies will guide you to eating more of a whole foods diet, getting rid of those um, actual, those processed foods and sugary beverages and sort of processed meats and sort of eliminating sort of that meat intake, right? 
So that's what you will see sort of across the, the line for, for most studies. And so we won't go into all those studies today so we can get to some of these things that you may not have known about, but that is sort of the general consensus. And then getting people to understand what actually is a serving size, right? And so getting patients, if you are eating meat, for example, sort of three to four ounces of lean meat, whereas I tell patients to think about it, when you go to a steak restaurant and they sort of tell you about your specials, they always are so proud to tell you that they have a 10, 12 ounce special, that's your steak, right? And people take that and we're like, oh, great, that's amazing, of course I want that. But that's actually three, that's enough for three people technically, right? And so then they give you sort of maybe a big, huge thing of mashed potatoes and then maybe two or three asparagus. So we get into our brains that these are portion sizes. So most patients will say, of course I eat vegetables, but are you having a serving of vegetables? Because the two asparagus on top of your 12 ounces of steak is not a serving. And so getting people just to think about how much they're actually getting in and being sort of honest with themselves, but actually knowing what that means. What is a serving size? And this is sort of a general from Harvard, sort of the general healthy eating plate idea. So instead of trying to go and measure food and think about sort of all and sort of getting cups and these sort of things for eating, I try to get people to think about sort of how to just a proportion your plate. And so doing these small things will help with caloric intake and help with sort of reducing sort of how much you're getting in every day by just thinking, I try to tell patients to think about a half of your plate being vegetables, right? So an entire half of your plate, and here they have vegetables and some fruit. That's also great because that's going to be increased fiber. And then a fourth of your plate being whole grains, and then a fourth of your plate being some type of healthy protein, whether that be, um, um, and remembering other sources of protein being things like beans um, or chickpea pastas. These are all sort of other good sources of protein or sort of having that lean fish or uh, poultry are some of the things they sort of recommend here because we know all patients are not gonna go plant-based. So we try to reduce how much of that we're getting in. Um, and again, avoiding sort of and limiting sort of red meat, sort of the processed meats, bacon, sausage, um, cold cuts, those sorts of things. And then getting people to drink more water. Um, it's surprising how many patients do not drink water every single day, how much um, tea and juice and coffee and sodas that people are getting in every day. So trying to get patients to drink more water. It's amazing how patients will say how much better they feel just simply by drinking more water. And then thinking about sort of how much oil and butter we're using and sort of in thinking and getting, and getting away from us a little bit when we're sauteing our vegetables or when we're making salad dressings and just thinking about that a little bit more. And that again, goes alongside with sort of portion control and portion sizes. Then the next big thing is food labels. Most patients only look at sort of the caloric intake and that's how they determine whether something is good or bad, right? Or carbs. Um, and so one of the things I wanna get people to look at a little bit more is before you even look there, let's look at the ingredients, right? So what else do you see on that label? How many ingredients are you seeing? What is that? What are those first couple ingredients which sort of correlate to being the thing that is the most abundant in that food? And so, and does it say whole grain or is it something that is refined? Um, and these are things that we want to give, pay some attention to. And so one of the big things when I do my talks is people say, oh, it's too expensive to eat, sort of um, to eat this way. And I give them an example, usually of oatmeal. And so it's all about marketing and marketing really gets, as we talked about before, that is something that happens a lot, which is marketing. And what we will see is, um, that if you, those Quaker oats that come with like all of the flavoring, they're sort of marketed as instant, so they're easy as a package. You put it in a thing and you put it in the microwave and it's done, right? But this is, you turn around that package and I guarantee you're gonna see a whole lot more than just organic whole grains. And the thought is that, oh, these are six in the box. It is, you know, it's a very cheap price. It's not that big of a deal. But there's only six servings there, whereas you have about 19 servings, 20 servings in this thing, depending on how much you have each time, right? And that bag is far cheaper than that box of six. And it's healthier for you with less ingredients, right? And you can add whatever else, your cinnamon or whatever you want to add to it, sort of on your end with your own fruit on top, rather than sort of these fruits that have been refined and, and dried and those sort of things. And so getting patients to sort of pay attention to sort of their protein intake, their fiber intake, whether there's added sugars, which you will see in sort of a lot of those processed things. Um, and then sort of thinking about sort of the caloric intake and how much an actual serving is. But the big thing I'll get people to look at first is what does that ingredient la label say? 
And then when we talk about sort of medication assessment, right? So taking a look at patients' medical history, I'm looking at all the medications they may be on and sort of putting those medications to different buckets, whether they are weight positive, weight neutral, or weight negative. And the goal is to get patients sort of to transition them off of some of those weight positive medications and get them to weight neutral or weight negative medications. And so we wanna take away any other contributing factor that could be causing patients to have difficulty with weight. And so sometimes it's as simple as us talking to their therapist or their primary care doctor or their gynecologist or endocrinologist to say, hey, instead of this, you know, pioglitazone that's often used for diabetes, what about using metformin or what about using ozempic? Because these are things that we know are weight negative, Um, whereas we know pioglitazone can be weight positive and cause a little bit of weight gain. So we want to give patients every single bit of effort, every opportunity to be able to get into their, take away all those possible contributions factors. And then sort of we talk about medical history and things that can contribute, right? So if we think about medications first and then think about sort of those things that also can happen. So genetic syndromes, which are pretty rare, um, medical conditions, if somebody has recently had a surgery or has something going on with their joints or certain types of sleep disorders, cardiac liver disease, vitamin deficiencies or hormonal imbalances. And the big piece, the very big piece is getting patients psychological behaviors and conditions well controlled as well. So whether that be night eating, anxiety, depression, binge eating, these are things that are important to address as well. And now that brings us to sort of anti-obesity pharmacology. And so this is one of those things that I think is sort of taboo, sort of in medicine. Um, I think a lot of it is stemming from a lot of weight bias and not understanding um, sort of obesity in general. Um, And so let's get into that. And so these are medications that have been FDA approved and come out over maybe the last 10 years or so, um, but they're underused, right? And so this is sort of mind boggling to me, um, being used in sort of conjunction with the physician that is sort of helping you with lifestyle changes, of course. But as I talk to my patients and I tell other physicians when we do talks, if a patient comes to the emergency department with a blood pressure of 180 over 100, you would not send them out and tell them to go lose weight to help them with their blood pressure. You would treat their blood pressure. So why is there such a sort of a stigma around helping patients to gain weight loss, which we know is going to help those other sort of medical problems, right? We know that with the five to 7% total body weight loss, we can see reductions in blood pressure. We see reductions in hemoglobin A1C or that diabetes number. We see reductions in cholesterol as well. We see also reversal of fatty liver disease with as little as five to 7% of their total body weight loss. So why not give patients these extra tools in addition to helping them understand those things we talked about before with serving sizes, food labels and those sort of things, but giving patients as many options and tools available And what I've seen is that there's a lot of sort of bias from patients. Patients will say, well, I don't want to take the easy way out. I I, I need to be able to do it by myself because something is inherently wrong with me, right? Or physicians even say, oh, they should just diet more and move and just move out a little bit more, right? And so getting people to understand that, again, from that very first slide is not quite that simple. Also, the another thing is there is a panic of sort of some of these old drugs from like the 90s, right? So they, you know, there's all this investigation and fin fan is this, you know, this miracle that came but caused a lot of issues. And I think there's a lot of panic because of these sort of older medications that were removed from market. And so some of the ones that were withdrawn are listed here. And so usually those reasons were like valvular heart disease or pulmonary hypertension. One of them had some psychiatric side effects as well. So it was never sort of even brought to the US, um, but usually sort of things that sort of happen with the heart. Um, but just like with any medication, we always have to make sure, that's why we say to be under a physician's sort of um, monitoring, because I'm always gonna be monitoring people's blood pressure and side effects and symptoms and making sure that if somebody has uncontrolled blood pressure, then you won't be a candidate for some of these things in the first place. And so things that we sort of currently on the market are um, Zenical or Ali or Orlistat. And that one is a medication that is used to sort of reduce sort of fat absorption. So if some person has a higher fat diet, they take this medication and it reduces that absorption. And that's sort of how it works. Casimia is a dual medication of fentramine and topiramate. Um, And this one acts by sort of revving up your basal metabolic rate and reducing sort of that portion intake that we're having. So often we use this one in patients that say, I never feel full. 
I am hungry all of the time and I just cannot get full, right? And so this helps to be able to help your brain correlate with sort of the new things we're teaching you about portion size. And it's really just overcoming that habit. Um, Contrave is a dual medication of naltrexone and bupropion. This one is often used in patients that have emotional eating, that have binge eating, that have sort of snacking and grazing. Um, it helps with that sort of addict, um, that addiction to sort of food, right? Um, Sexenda or loragotide is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. This one works on that GLP, those hormones that come from your small bowel and go to the brain to help with appetite suppressant. This one's a weekly injection. But then the, the newer one on the market is sort of one most people don't want to inject every day. So semaglutide is a weekly injection and also a GLP-1 receptor agonist and also works pretty very well. Um, and so these also these medications are approved for long term use. So I normally will tell patients that remember, what do we talk about in that first side? Uh, obesity is a chronic and relapsing disease, right? And so we know that most patients will need this for a longer period of time. And it's sort of until we get patients to that habit. So where we've changed that microbiome, we've changed those behavioral habits, we've changed you into a way in which is a now a way of life. It is no longer feels like something that you're working towards or hard at. Um, there are short-term medications that are sort of approved, but we know that this is a chronic and relapsing disease. I don't use them very often, but they are available. And so when we dig into like the data, what are we actually getting from these medications, right? And so this is a, a slide we, I just made from putting all of these studies together to be able to determine sort of how much weight loss you get on each medication. And so um, this is to look at the percentage of patients in these studies that got at least 5% total body weight loss. Now remember, 5% is that cutoff we use because that means that we know we're making changes in diabetes number, high blood pressure, and cholesterol with just that 5%, right? And so blue is the control, meaning no medication at all. They are just testing what these patients were doing, sort of them, you know, they were getting some like a placebo typically. And then orange is sort of the low dose of the medication and casimia has a higher dose. So that's the high dose of the medication. And so what we see, the oral stats seem to get a lot of um, a good use here and a lot of patients that got at least 5%. I got to say, I don't see that typically in sort of practice because you have to be on a high fat diet for that to work really well. Um, but Casimia, you'll see the high dose. So we got about 68% of patients that, uh, that, that achieved 5% total body weight loss. Contrave, over 50%. And then Sexenda, over 50% as well. And then when we look at the percentage of people who got over 10% total body weight loss, and so now we're talking double, right? Um, we see earlier stat about a little over 40%, the high dose of Casimia, um, about 48%, Contrave, about 28%. And Sexenda a little bit lower with about 5% of that people, of those patients, they got over 10% of their total body weight loss. And then when we look at weight loss in kilograms, so what does this mean? So what does this percent body weight mean, right? So in kilograms for all of the stat, we saw about 11 kilograms. That ends up being about roughly 22 pounds. For Casimia, we see about 14, let's say. That's about 28 pounds of weight loss. For Contrave, about six kilograms, so about 12 pounds, and then Sexenda, about the same. So as we can see, we have sort of pretty nice ranges of sort of weight loss that patients are be able to achieve by just adding on one additional thing in addition to their diet and lifestyle changes. The other one I put on a separate slide because they sort of did the study a little bit differently um, with the semaglutide or the Wegovi. They did sort of a, a run-in period where they gave everybody the medication initially. And then at 20 weeks, they switched one of those groups to placebo to see what would happen. And then they kept one of them on the semaglutide. And what you see is they all lost weight during that first sort of 20 weeks and about 10% um, in, their, in their change in their total body weight. And when they switch people to that placebo, you saw they went up to that, they started to gain that weight back, right? As people who continued, continued with that weight loss. Um, and so that was sort of how they did the trial. So a little bit different. And so they also broke it down by patients who lost greater than 5, 10, 15, and 20% total body weight loss. Um, and they were comparing people, the placebo group, which is in the light green, and then the, the actual control, the group of who got the medication in that darker color. And as you can see, the people who could see it on the medication achieved greater weight loss, right? So 
almost 80, almost 85 to 90% of patients at least achieved 5%. So that's amazing. So we're reducing metabolic disease, right? Um, you got almost uh, 79, 80% that got over 10%. And then we had about 65-ish percent with over 15%. And then you got about 40% with over 20% total body weight loss. This is huge for us in medicine to get people to be able to get that much total body weight loss with a medication, right? And so that is why I think these medications are helpful um, in the right setting, of course. Now we're gonna move on to the other thing that a lot of patients don't know about and even a lot of physicians don't know about, which is bariatric endoscopy. Um, and bariatric endoscopy means there's no incision. Um, you go home the same day, there's no cuts on the abdomen. They're done through your mouth. So most people have heard of an upper endoscopy or a colonoscopy. Um, so similar to that in which these devices are done by upper endoscopy. So you're asleep, you don't uh, feel or remember anything, um, but importantly, there's no surgical incisions or hospital downtime and quicker recovery. So it's sort of that mini step before patients will go to sort of a surgical intervention. And the reason this these came about was, although there are many patients that are eligible um, to that meet criteria for bariatric surgery, we found that that number of patients that are actually signing up for those procedures is not going up every single year, even though these patients would have redu reduction in their diabetes, high blood pressure, um, cholesterol, fatty liver with the amount of weight loss they'd be able to achieve. I think there's A, stigma. I think there's B, a lot of patients that are concerned with having a, an elective surgery for something they feel like they should be able to do themselves. Um, and there's sort of the, the bias that, it's, that surrounds bariatric surgery, feeling like they're taking an easy way out, which we always sort of get rid of that bias right off front, right? And so these were sort of that middle ground that were sort of um, came up to help patients get a little bit more than medication, but a little bit less than surgery, but sort of that, that intermediate to sort of help jumpstart people. So this is broken down into sort of space occupying. So we'll talk about sort of intragastric balloons, um, suturing devices, which we in sort of suture the inside of the stomach to make it smaller. Um, we won't talk a lot about sort of bypass devices because they, there are some of those, most of those are still sort of just experimental and also some of these other devices. So we'll talk about the ones that sort of we do mostly, especially here in the US. So the balloon itself, um, initially approved in 85, and then there had some issues with it sort of going, sort of uh, going and migrating. So they got rid of them and went back to the drawing board and said, all right, let's do this a little bit better. Then they came back in 2004, then FDA abroad, and then in 2015, these balloons came to the U.S. And so the, per the indication for these is someone that has class two, um, class one or two obesity, which means a BMI of greater than 30 to 40. Um, they're kept in place for six months and then removed both endoscopically. So it takes about 10 minutes to insert and then it's removed. Also takes about 10 minutes that you're asleep and you wake up and you go home. Um, the way this balloon works is a space occupying, meaning it helps the patients to physically be able to reduce their portion size. So we're teaching patients about reducing portion size, but this balloon is sort of in the way. So you're not able to eat as much as you typically would. And during that period, I tell patients, the hard work is those initial, those six months that balloon's in place, because you are learning every single day to listen to your body. You're retraining your body to hear those triggers that have told you, you know, I am full. I am satiated. And that's because you physically don't feel great if you eat beyond that at this point. And that sends that signal to the brain to tell yourself, you know what? I think the next time I was probably full at about three bites last time. I think that's enough for me. And it's, that's the goal is to get people to re-engage listening to your body. And we call it mindfulness. It's being mindful of how you feel when you're eating and being more in tune with your body and slowing down a bit. And so just to show you how that works a bit here. So we are inserting the balloon into the stomach here, and then we fill it with about 500 cc's of fluid, take the scope out, leave it in place. That way when you're eating, it's taking up space in your stomach. So you're not able to eat as much. And I'm teaching you that you can feel satiated with smaller portion sizes. We come back in six months, we poke a little needle in there and we're able to suction all of that um, volume out sort of endoscopically and pulling, making that balloon real small again. And then we're able to take it out and then you're all done. Um, usually patients have lost um, the studies will say at least 10% of total body weight loss, but typically we see a lot more and it's because we make sure patients are following up and coming back in to be able to understand um, what is happening and sort of teaching them those same things we talked about before. 
um, nutrition labels, serving size, thinking about how to eat when you go out, listening to how you feel when you have particular foods, listening to your body. And patients that we see will often continue to lose weight even when the balloon is out because they have instituted and they sort of really bought into sort of a new way of living and a new way of sort of thinking about food and considering intake. Um, and this is what it looks like sort of in an actual patient. This is an actual stomach with a balloon that's sort of placed inside. And so if you can see, it's sort of taking up a, a, a large portion of the stomach here. And that's just the scope itself, just sort of looking back on itself to be able to see what the balloon looks like. Um, the reshaped balloon is a balloon that has two different balloons. And the idea was that it would reduce sort of migration, which is what was a, a problem sort of years ago. Um, and, but the idea was that it would cause less symptoms in patients. Um, the next balloon is the Obalon balloon, and that was like a, it's a gas filled balloon. Um, so the problem with the volume filled balloon with the liquid is it feels really heavy, it can cause some nausea and vomiting. People can feel pretty uncomfortable. So the idea was, why don't we create one filled with gas so it's lighter, so people don't feel um, as heavy. Um, and so this is that one. So patients would swallow um, a balloon that's attached to a little cord that's there. It goes down into their, um, through the esophagus um, and into the stomach there. Um, and then we sort of have to make sure by using sort of another device that sort of it's in that area. Um, and then we're able to fill it. So we use sort of an imaging device to make sure it's actually in the stomach and not anywhere else. Um, and then sort of fill it with, with gas, right? And then we sort of slowly would show people over time, see how they're doing, to see how satiated they feel, to monitor those symptoms. Once they feel okay with that one, then over time they'd be able to add an additional balloon, right? The upside for some people is they didn't have to have endoscopy to place the balloon, um, but so you will have to have it to have it removed, right? And so the patients, and so you're able to sort of slowly sort of increase how many balloons patients have over time. And typically you can get up to about three, which each balloon having a volume of about 250 cc's. And so it's, this balloon will cause patients to have definitely less symptoms than the saline filled balloon. Um, but it's a, so it takes a little bit longer. Um, and also patients don't lose as much weight as they would with the other balloon. Um, but it is very uh, much better tolerated there. So as you can see, what it would sort of look like with sort of three balloons in place, still coming back at that six month period to come back in and have those balloons sort of removed, right? And it's taking that air out and sort of reducing the size of those balloons and being able to remove them and sort of endoscopically. Also at the same time, checking that stomach to make sure nothing is abnormal that's happening there. And so when we compare sort of the data of how much people are actually losing, um, they have the control versus the actual procedure group. Um, and what you'll find is definitely always more in the active group. And like we talked about the Orbera, which is the first balloon with the fluid is the one that got the most weight loss. So typically at least 10% total body weight loss. But like I said, in clinical practice, we always see more. Contraindications to these balloons. If a patient has had gastric surgery in the past, if they have a really big hiatal hernia, um, a coagulation disorder, meaning a bleeding disorder, um, potentially a bleeding disease because we don't want to irritate that, um, pregnancy, um, alcoholism or drug addiction or severe liver disease because that can cause varices and then we can irritate those with that balloon moving around and cause bleeding. It's sort of relative kinds of contraindications of things we think about are things like esophagitis, so making sure that's treated first. Crohn's disease, making sure patients are um, well controlled cold with their Crohn's. Um, chronic NSAID use, and that's because NSAIDs can cause people to have ulcers and that can irritate things, make people have bleeding. Um, and then uncontrolled psychiatric illnesses like binge eating, nighttime eating, um, bulimia, anorexia, these types of things as well. So making sure those things are well controlled before proceeding. Um, and then adverse events, we alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, when you have that um, saline filled balloon, patients tend to have, and we talk about sort of before they get it, that first week you will have a lot of nausea, maybe some vomiting and some abdominal discomfort. You sort of just feel that sort of balloon sloshing around. And sort of the biggest risk is having to have that removed early because they just can't tolerate it. So we make sure we talk about that in detail. So if it's somebody that has baseline bloating, abdominal pain, these are things, it's not probably a procedure for you because you're gonna feel pretty miserable. Um, let's see, hyperinflation, uh, which means the balloon continues to fill with air even though we're not putting anything in there. 
Um, and that tends to happen if people sort of leave the balloon in place for a longer period of time. There was a patient that presented from a different country um, that had left the balloon in place for over a year um, and was having with a, a lot of abdominal pain. And that's because she'd had hyperinflation. And the reason being is the balloon, that's why the balloons are made to be removed in six months. Um, acute pancreatitis is another complication. And then the um, death rate, right? And so what was a big deal a couple of years ago was there was like, oh my goodness, it's all of these deaths from balloons. Um, but when you look at the total number of balloons being placed worldwide versus the number of deaths, it was 18. Um, and they did not disclose that, but when you looked into more detail, there was a person who had a car accident and it just happened to have a balloon. The balloon did not cause a car accident. There was one person who had a heart attack the balloon didn't cause the heart attack. So there are many other reasons, but they happen, they have to be reported because they had a balloon in place at the time of death. Um, limitations to this, um, they are unable to provide sort of long-term substantial weight loss unless a patient really buys in and continues to stick with the plan we've instituted. And then costs, because most insurers don't cover it. Although this past week I've had a patient that was able to get it approved by their insurer. So hopefully we're moving that needle so that they are able to get some of these things covered. The transpyloric shuttle is another sort of uh, while the patient device. is sorry that was loud um, in which you're able to basically put a little device into the abdomen that sort of into the stomach that really bobs back and forth in the stomach that sort of creates sort of a bowel obstruction um, which we don't typically like as GI doctors um, but this one is sort of slowly sort of keeping food into the stomach for a longer period of time so that people feel full for a longer period of time so it increases sort of uh, decreases that uh, gastric emptying. So yeah, if you can imagine, so do you eat a meal, it's not able to leave the stomach because this little thing that we're inserting is sort of closing off the way that it would exit to get out of the stomach, which is going into the small bowel. So if you continue to have food in your stomach that is sort of stretching those stomach and those receptors, that you don't get that signal that makes you feel actually hungry. Um, and so you're thereby sort of reducing caloric intake by eating less and not having that urge to sort of snack and that sort of thing. And so as you can see, it sort of moves sort of back and forth. And as it moves into that area, um, peristaltic waves will sort of move it back and forth. And as the stomach is sort of moving, um, you'll notice that most of that stuff is sort of sitting in the stomach. The bulb will sort of move out a little bit and then allow a little bit more. This is sort of just all happening sort of throughout the day without you even sort of having to be aware of it. And so that's sort of how that one works. And then the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. Um, this is one that was sought to sort of mimic the surgical sleeve, but without cutting the actual stomach off here. And the first row. what we see here is what we do is instead of there being a balloon on the inside of the stomach, there's a suturing device. And what we're doing is taking sort of several bites throughout the stomach um, and with the goal of being able to sort of cinch that stomach, make it much smaller and sort of reduce that size, right? And sort of zipping it up. And so being able to sort of try to make a smaller, more tubular shaped stomach by the time we get done, that sort of reduce that sort of inside um, anatomy to about 30% of the size that it typically was before. And so as you can imagine with a reduced sort of um, volume, you're eating less. Um, the other ways in which that is working is typically when you eat, you're sort of, you're also reducing patients sort of, um, their ability to empty. So things are sitting in the stomach for a longer period of time. Um, so you have the late gastric emptying and you're also sort of had since having food sitting around for a longer period of time, you're also feeling satiated for longer. So you're there by eating less as well. We also sort of use ghrelin to our advantage because we're having food that's sort of sitting in that area. So it's sending that signal to the brain that says they don't need to send you that signal to make you feel hungry again. And then, so this is what this looks like sort of in a real patient. So on the left is sort of a normal sort of large stomach here um, with air in it, sort of what it normally looks like. And then this is the device itself, but sort of how you can see how small that stomach is made sort of with those suturing devices. And again, going home the same day, no incisions and sort of having those results sort of right away. And so the data for the endoscopic sleeve, um, so now there's been like five year data to sort of help us to be able to understand what happens over time. And so initially we definitely see um, over 75% of patients that have at least 10% of their total body weight loss with this procedure. And that corresponded to about 18.1 um, kilograms. And so about a little less than 40 pounds, right? 
Um, and then at five years, the question with these procedures is how durable are they? Are they as durable as surgical procedures, which means do you still continue to have success five years out or do those uh, success sort of wane? And what we found is about the same amount you know, of weight loss that we see sustained at those five years. So over 69% of patients still with over 10% of that total body weight loss at that time, averaging out at about 15% of that total body weight loss, 14 to 15%. And that's really the goal to make sure people are able to sustain this weight loss, right? And so some of the adverse events you can see are abdominal pain, um, typically very minimum. Um, you can get a perigastric fluid collection, but rare. There can be GI bleeding. As I tell my patients, we are causing bleeding by sort of um, nicking the stomach sort of over and over and over again with sort of a needle. So we're able to usually treat it if we see it well in there. And then on rare causes, sort of a perforation, but also very rare. Um, another device called POSE-2 um, is not approved here in the U.S., but um, can be seen sort of abroad. And it's sort of similar, but it's a sort of a plication device that does full body thickness. Um, and it's sort of a, a different sort of uh, procedure that's a little bit different than the endoscopic sleeve. Um, but it's sort of the same idea, which is invaginating the stomach. As you see, it's sort of bringing it towards you and placing these little sort of um, baskets to sort of create the stomach and pull it in to make it a lot smaller. So it's a little bit more um, technical and complicated and it requires sort of two people, one person that's holding one of the scopes and one person holding the actual device. Um, but when it gets, when you get done, you sort of have a similar sort of um, approach to being able to shrink the size of the stomach um, and sort of reduce sort of how much patients are intaking. All right, so that's what it looks like when it gets done. So a much smaller sort of um, shortened stomach as well. And the data there, there's been some two-year data on many patients. Um, and this is from Madrid, Spain, where one of the experts does a lot of these procedures. Um, and what he was able to find is at after about 24 months, the patients were able to keep off about 15% of their total body weight loss. And these patients were mostly, um, you know, mixed male and female. Um, they were starting at about a BMI of 37, um, and they didn't have any serious complications, and most of them had a lot of follow-up. And so this is just showing sort of the safety and efficacy of these procedures. Adverse events. But this one, the big one is sore throat because of how large the, the, the device is. Some abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, some bleeding, um, rare complications of perforation um, or pneumothorax. Um, I think they, they've had a one um, complication of an abscess that was resolved without surgery. So rare complications as if you can have with any procedure, but um, overall safer and of course going home the same day. And now we talk a little bit about the thing that we usually we know more about, which is sort of bariatric surgery. Um, and the thing I like to talk about here is, you know, these are have gotten so much safer um, over the years. They're laparoscopic, so usually just done through some ports. Um, and they, you know, they're they're fairly quick now, so it's easy as sort of taking out a gallbladder at this point. And so. Um, but the ones we know a lot about of the ruin Y gastric bypass in which you're actually bypassing a portion of your small bowel. Used less frequently now is the, the lap band, so that's not used a, a lot. Um, the gastric sleeve where you're cutting off sort of a large part of the body of the stomach. Um, and the virtual, the vertical band of gastroplasty also not used a whole lot anymore. So mostly the, gast um, the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin Y gastric bypass are used mostly. So this is a study that showed us a little bit of the data, like we talked about before, of sort of how effective and how much weight loss patients can um, expect with bariatric procedures and bariatric surgery. And so you're going to see a, a difference in sort of more weight loss with bariatric surgeries versus an endoscopic procedure. And so if there's a patient that needs a larger degree of weight loss, we will often talk about sort of where their surgery is a better option for them or how they feel about sort of how, what their trajectory has been in the past, what we think is going to be helpful, um, what they're going to be able to achieve, how difficult weight loss has been to achieve for them over the years, and sort of what their history is going to be that gives us an idea of sort of how difficult things are going to be. And so at one year, we'll see in this left column here, 
the sleeve gastrectomy versus the ruin Y gastric bypass. Um, you'll see that patients' um, total weight loss will be um, the sleeve 25.2, and then the ruin gastric bypass at about 31.2. At three years, you see you sort of are able to sustain about 21% with the sleeve gastrectomy and with the ruin wide gastric bypass, about 29%. And then sustainable at uh, five years with about 18.8% with the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin wide gastric bypass um, at 25.5%. And so, as you can see, less than we saw with the endoscopic procedures, but well tolerated and sort of been able to sort of sustain over that five year period. Um, they do talk about the um, the gastric band, but those are actually, we saw less on why people don't use it really as much anymore. So um, we'll just talk about the two, the two main ones, which are the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin Y gastric bypass. And so when we bring all of this together, right, we've talked about a lot today. Um, the one thing I want people to take home is that excess weight is complicated. So giving yourself a little bit of grace, giving your family members a little bit of grace, um, being able to understand that it's not just sort of how much we're eating and how much we're moving. Understanding that it is a chronic disease that is relapsing, um, that is multifactorial, that there's so many factors, right? Uh, but also there are many treatment modalities that are now available too, right? And so starting with the basics with understanding food, understanding nutrition, understanding sort of portion control and portion sizes, understanding sort of dietary intake, um, not beating yourself up about sort of eating too little and sort of caloric intake and understanding sort of those are going to affect each person's body very differently. Um, and sort of trying to change those ratios of sort of what we're eating with sort of reducing a lot of that processed food and those sugary sweetened beverages and processed foods while increasing those things that are going to be higher in fiber, those fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, beans, nuts, and also those that water intake. Getting people to just get some activity, just to get moving, some, uh, but recognizing that you can't outrun, right, that dietary, those dietary habits thinking about those underlying medical conditions that can cause patients to have symptoms. Um, so making sure those things are kept into account and sort of considered. Um, considering anti-obesity medications and sort of not being sort of um, put into a bucket and saying, oh no, I can't use those. Thinking about those and determining what's right for each patient because they may not be right for everyone, but determining which one may be right for each particular patient not forgetting those endoscopic bariatric procedures as sort of that intermediate for patients that sort of don't want surgery, but they need a little bit something more to sort of help them in their journey. And then always remembering those surgical options um, and being at a bariatric center of excellence is an also thing to make people feel a little bit more comfortable, but knowing that this is something that is lifelong, something that we have to work on forever because we know it's chronic and relapsing and knowing that it's a really a lifestyle change that we try to get patients to sort of consider instead of thinking it is something that's a fad is something they can just knock off of the list and be done with it and so that is sort of i think that is it here so yes that is it so i think now we will open to questions thank you so so much for this this was amazing dr laster um we really really appreciate it and um yeah so definitely time for questions and um just want to make sure that everybody on our end knows how to go about doing that. So give me a moment to uh, tell that to everybody. Um, first of all, folks, you most of you know, we typically don't take questions directly from the chat box, but we do ask you to go ahead and, <clears throat> excuse me, raise your virtual hand. And so in case anybody doesn't know how to do that, uh, all you need to do is click on your reactions tab on your Zoom window. And when you, once you click on the reactions tab, you'll see a, uh, an emoji that says raise hand. You click on that. We'll see your hand raised. I will call your first name when it's your turn and I'll unmute you as well. And you'll be all set to go. So I already see a few hands raised, Dr. Laster, and um, we'll jump right in. But again, thank you so much for a very, very thorough presentation. We really, really awesome. appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. Um, so here we go. It looks like Sophia is up first. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Dr. My question is more about gastritis and CRP levels. Uh, I am on a healthy plant-based diet. I have no ulcers, but struggling with persistent gastritis for many years and RA. All my markers are, are good, except CRP is about uh, three and six. 
and sedimentation rate is a bit high. I try to reduce stress levels. Also, I am sensitive to bro probiotics and a lot of food. Could you please tell me what would help? So, good question. So, when patients ask about gastritis, I, uh, first I want to go back and sort of to define what that actually means because gastritis is technically a histological term, which means it's not a diagnosis of anything. Um, and so that's something that you can see, you know, a little bit of sort of inflammatory cells if somebody takes biopsies of your stomach. There's no other way to sort of diagnose or to be able to have a, um, a diagnosis of gastritis, right? So that's the first thing. So I think a lot of patients, if they have abdominal discomfort or they go to the emergency room, the emergency room will say, oh, you just have gastritis. And that's not technically a diagnosis. So, and it's something that is usually caused by something else. So if somebody takes a lot of NSAIDs, for example, that can cause a gastritis, right? If somebody has a H. pylori infection that can cause a gastritis, particular medications can cause a gastritis. And the term gastritis just means inflammation. It just means inflammation of like the lining or cells of a particular, you can have inflammation anywhere of the knee, of the, the gallbladder, cholecystitis, anything can have sort of increased inflammation. So the first thing I would say is, is it um, endoscopically proven actual gastritis? And then understanding that that is sort of just from it's just a term from a pathologist that doesn't people, some patients will have a little bit of redness in their stomach when we go in for an endoscopy. And that doesn't mean that they have symptoms. Doesn't mean that there is anything wrong. You can just see a little bit of redness or a little bit of inflammation. So first it would be making sure there's no medications that are contributing. Um, and then making sure that you're not on, like, especially NSAIDs are a big one. Um, and then also make sure there's no H. pylori or anything like that that can also contribute to sort of that diagnosis. And so, and as far as the CRP, I think I heard you say you had an, um, a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. That is an, a, an inflammatory disease. And so that would be something that definitely to chat with your rheumat uh, rheumatologist about, because that can be seen with just in the setting of having an inflammatory disease in general. And sometimes that's how they sort of check, you know, sort of follow your disease pattern for us, um, for GI. Um, the correlation for us is patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. And so we follow their CRP and ESR numbers as well. So to determine when they're having a flare or when their medications aren't working well and how that correlates. And so um, that can be elevated just in the setting of having a, a rheumatological sort of inflammatory disease. And so not may not for you, may not be in the setting of, of diet, but um, can most likely, I think, would probably, especially with the diet that you're describing, is most likely in the setting of sort of uh, the rheumatologic sort of disorder in general. Thank you very, very much for that, doctor. And um, <clears throat> let's go now to uh, Michelle. Well, sorry, Michelle. Michelle, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, doctor, I, I'm, I joined a little bit late, so I'm not sure if you referred to the study where they took the obese mouse and the skinny mouse and they injected the microbiomes and switched them and, and they were able to, you know, with, by changing microbiome, make the fat mouse skinny. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in your opinion. That if, if somebody is morbidly obese and they their first choice would be to try to find the resolve in the support systems to do it through um, a whole food plant-based diet. Like if we kind of refer to that mouse study, in your opinion, is that possible? Like, do you think it's actually clinically possible for a very morbidly obese person who's been that way for, you know, a couple of decades to get that kind of result, like the, like the, the, the obese mouse that became a skinny, skinny mouse just by feeding and nurturing a healthy microbiome? So, and I'm not sure if the question is um, whether just injecting a microbiome or changing the diet. So I'll address both of them. I didn't talk about that study, but I, I, I was like, okay, I got to give these people a, a break and not go too crazy. But um, I did talk about microbiome because I love the microbiome. And I think it's down the line, that's going to be very helpful in precision medicine. And I also love that study too. So um, the one thing is, I think that we are the simpler of those questions is whether we can sort of inject sort of a healthy microbiome into um, a patient that has obesity to sort of help them lose weight. I don't think we're there yet. I think there are a lot of studies, some of which that I was sort of being able to do with my patients to be able to understand sort of what is a common um, microbiome makeup of patients that have are afflicted with excess weight versus um, a patient that has sort of a quote unquote normal um, or healthy weight. And so 
we we do know that there are some changes, but the problem is right now, sort of the microbiome data, sort of like the tip of the iceberg. We don't know sort of everything underneath there yet, so we don't know um, exactly what strains, how much, and sort of we. So those are things we just don't know. We all, the only thing we know right now is to sort of try to get the most diversity possible. Um, and so sort of, and we know how to change diversity is with sort of a whole foods and a plant-based diet with a diet that's mostly fiber and with reduced processed foods. The second part of that question um, was about if we think you could change a patient that has morbid obesity with just a whole food plant-based diet. So that one is far more complicated because it depends on all the other factors um, that likely contributed for that patient. So what medications are they on? What are their genetics? Um, how to, what are their epigenetics? Um, sort of what are they intaking? What is their caloric intake? How much are they sleeping? How much stress? Um, so do I think that is a step in the right direction and will certainly help? Yes. Um, do I, and, and will it be sort of the ends all be all? Maybe not. Um, and in some of those patients in my practice, we, that's where we for sure start. Um, we start with dietary changes before we do sort of anything else is understanding food because that is going to be what sustains you. It's understanding how much we're eating, understanding what labels mean, understanding how preparing meals and foods and preparing your plate, how to set ratios of your plate, overcoming sort of those emotional eating sort of habits. Um, over listening to your body and being mindful and being slowing down when you're eating, paying attention to those things and sort of getting GI symptoms under control. And so I think always starting there is super important, but for a lot of patients, um, they may need something if they're morbid, having morbid obesity, they may need a little bit more. Um, but I think that background, that, that foundation is sort of imperative, especially if they're going to sustain that weight loss, because I can't tell you how many patients that I've seen that have had a gastric bypass and initially lost weight, but now they've gained it all back and then some. And it's because that sort of foundation was not there to begin with for them to be able to grow upon, because life is going to always happen and you're going to still have insults, you know, pandemic was a big one for people, but it's death in the family, changing a job, some kid come in to live back in your house again, all these other things that can happen that throw your life completely off track. So under getting people to understand what those coping mechanisms are going to be, how to institute them, and sort of what their their strengths are going to be, and what they're going to need to lean on when life inevitably happens. So um, I think it's not as simple as just a whole food plant-based diet. I think that's going to be major. And most patients will tell me, even though they've only lost maybe five or seven pounds. And when we first start with that, they tell me how much more energy they have. They're able to sleep better. Their joints feel better with just minimum amounts of weight loss, just with those dietary changes. They're not bloated. They're not fatigued. They're not tired all day long. They wake up feeling more ready to go, more invigorated. And so once I get people to, to feel those things, it's almost like I, I got them. They, they're, they're saying, oh yeah, I can feel better. This is great. This is like, this is even better. I call them non-scale wins. So having those non-scale wins are, are super important. Thanks very, very much for that, doctor. And um, let's go now to Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, great presentation today, uh, doctor. Really appreciate it. Um, with regards to Crohn's disease, what is your opinion with uh, whole grains, both with and without gluten on patients with Crohn's disease? And other than the, the blood biomarkers like CRP and then stool like calprotectin, what symptoms should a patient with Crohn's disease look for with uh, specifically to like when eating whole grains as far as are these good or bad for me? Or does it really, if a patient doesn't experience those systems, does that mean the food is a go or does it really should go to those, those blood biomarkers? Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, let's see. So with Crohn's, so for people who don't know, Crohn's can affect anywhere in the GI tract. So that one is very different than ulcerative colitis. So when a patient has Crohn's disease, what symptoms they're going to have is dependent upon where in their GI tract they have symptoms. So some patients will only have colonic disease or rectal disease where they have a lot of bloody stools or diarrhea, that sort of thing, or mucousy stools. Some patients will have um, Crohn's that are sort of primarily in their terminal ileum or in their small bowel. They can cause strictures are narrowing. So those patients can get bloating um, and they feel like they can't pass through it at all. And they have a lot of nausea or vomiting because of those strictures. Some patients can have what's called fistulizing disease where they have sort of um, their colon can sort of connect to their vaginal wall where they poop um, uh, urine, uh, like from their urinary tract, they can have poop and um, they can have it to their skin, um, which is called a cutaneous fistula. So it can happen anywhere in the GI tract. So that's the first thing. So whether people are having symptoms are dependent upon or what symptoms to look out for depends on where your disease is sort of um, 
uh, mostly in your throughout your GI tract. So that's the first piece. The other piece when we talk about diet and my patients with IBD um, is to think to, to the gluten sort of issue, and that's a whole other topic there because a lot of patients um, often I'll tell patients is next probably not the gluten that's causing you problems because usually we are going to be doing biopsies to look for celiac disease, um, to look for any other actual sort of gluten allergy. Um, but most of my patients that have a sensitivity is usually not the gluten, it's usually the other processed stuff in the food um, with the gluten itself. And so when I get patients, I had a patient just yesterday that was, um, I was just sort of, let's just switch your bread a little bit. So now she's on an Ezekiel bread. So let's have something that's actually a whole grain. And she goes, huh, I thought I couldn't tolerate gluten. It was clearly the fact that I was eating processed grains and processed foods with a bunch of other emulsifiers and additives that were causing her to have symptoms because the Ezekiel bread works just fine. Um, or patients will tell me when they traveled abroad, I can eat pasta when I'm in Italy. What is wrong with me? When I have pasta in the US, it feels terrible. Is that the gluten then? It's sort of the, the things that we are allowing sort of in this country to put in our foods, so those emulsifiers we talked about that cause people to have a lot of these symptoms. So um, with that one, I would say sort of paying attention to those food labels, looking for those major emulsifiers like polysorbate 80, um, carrageenan, um, carboxymethylcellulose, um, all of those different guar gums and lecithins that we see. These are all things that we'll see sort of ubiquitous in a lot of our foods that cause us to have a lot of symptoms. Um, another thing you asked was about other markers. So typically, even if I have a patient that's in remission, um, at least every six months to a year, we're gonna be checking fecal calprotectin, CRP, ESR, um, checking their vitamin levels, because I know with Crohn's disease, you sometimes don't absorb certain um, nutrients from your food well. So calcium, vitamin D, iron, um, magnesium, um, B12, folate, these are all things we're going to be checking to sort of give us an overall picture. In addition to what you're telling us, you feel how many stools you're having a day, if you're seeing blood, if you're having nausea, vomiting, bloating, um, if you're able to have a good appetite, if you have good energy, because if you're not having those things and I see your blood counts a little bit low, your iron's a little bit low, that tells me, tell, telling me you're probably losing a little bit of blood somewhere and something's not going great. Um, if your fecal cow protect and those things are also elevated. And sometimes I have, and it's good to know that baseline too, because sometimes I'll have patients that don't mount the CRP response, but it doesn't mean they're not having a flare. So um, they tell me they're having symptoms. We end up taking a look with a colonoscopy and I'm like, oh yeah, definitely a flare. So um, I think, and the other answer to that is so figuring out sort of A, knowing what those um, ingredient labels are showing and then listening to your body to see sort of what causes you symptoms and what doesn't. Thank you very much for that, doctor. And um, very thorough. We really, really appreciate it. I'm a uh, GI nerd, as you can tell. <laughs> it's, uh, again, we're very grateful for it. So thank you. Uh, let's go now to Gary. Gary, welcome. Thank you. I had a question about the pharmacological uh, interventions. Um, I carry some Orlistat around, you know, it's OTC, just in case I happen to, you know, have to take in some oil when I eat somewhere. But usually, I don't have much uh, fat in my diet, so I wouldn't be wanting to use that regularly. But of the other four that you mentioned, if there are no contraindications, do you have a preference on one of them or, or how would you decide which one to go with? Yeah, good question. Um, and so Orlistat, I don't use typically a lot because like you said, you have to be on a high fat diet for it to work. And for people who don't know, it sort of makes you have a bunch of loose stools. So it's not often sort of a thing that's really um, desired by most of my patients. So people are wanting to have nice, normal form stools, not a bunch of loose sort of stools throughout the day. So the other medications, it was a recent study that sort of was able to show us and sort of help us use phenotypes to sort of figure out which one that patients would work best with. And so it all depends on sort of the patient's sort of trajectory, what they've done before, their contraindications, family history and some of those, because if you have certain family histories, you're not a candidate for some of those medications. But in general, if it's a patient that is sort of significantly hungry all the time, um, that sort of has a hard time feeling satiated, a hard time getting full, then the casimia, which is the fentramine and topiramate is a good option for those patients. Um, for patients that have sort of nighttime eating and grazing and sort of um, binge eating and sort of snacking and emotional eating, I use Contrave in those patients. Um, and then for patients that may have um, diabetes, um, but also um, sort of feels 
maybe have diabetes and also sort of I can sense that there's something hormonal happening that say they're already sort of having a sort of pretty mem uh, pretty well controlled diet and portion size they're working out but they still can't nudge move those things it makes us think that something hormonal is happening and so we go be maybe a good option in those people so and is even beyond that it still depends on like I said family history blood pressure side effects of medications matter too for example with fentramine people um, it causes insomnia. So if I have a patient that already has insomnia, that is not a good option. Um, if it's a patient, it also can cause sort of tingling in the, the fingers a bit. Um, it goes away, but it can happen. And so if I have a person who is a hand surgeon and needs to have precision, then that medication, even if you want it, it's not a good go for you because you have to do very fine movements. So it's all, you know, um, sort of a little bit of this and a little bit of that before you sort of make a decision. Thanks again, doctor. And up next, we're going to bring in uh, Mike. Mike, you're welcome. Hello. Hello. Dr. Lassiter, you are such a firecracker and a knowledgeable person. And I hope that I wouldn't have to pay by the word that you give us because you really put the words together in your description. My question is, I'm trying to be preventative on leaky gut. My wheat zoomer was moderate for leaky gut indices. So I take apples, I eat apples for the pectin. Any other suggestions besides that to kind of make sure I don't get a leaky gut and the symptoms that come with it? Yeah. So thank you, first of all, for watching all of my, my crazy for an hour and a half. You guys are troopers. Um, the fellows can only last an hour. So this is impressive. Um, but so leaky gut um, is not sort of a technical sort of diagnosis we have in GI. So, but what we alluded to a little bit earlier is sort of what actually happens is sort of breaking down that membrane, that, that one cell thick membrane that we have in the small bowel um, that creates sort of a, in a sense where the term came from, sort of little breaks in the barrier, right? That's what causes the symptoms that people typically will present to us with. And so to overcome that, that one particular food that I tell patients they should start to incorporate, but it's really sort of general and overall. And sort of when I get patients off of processed foods to sort of pay attention to those food labels when they're noticing, most of my patients will say, oh my God, now that I look in my cabinet, everything in here has emulsifiers and additives in it. I'm like, yeah, I know. I went down that rabbit hole years ago. That's what sort of got me understanding what was happening to my patients in the first place. Um, and so that is sort of the first step is getting patients off of processed foods. And just the thing that sort of heals that microbiome and sort of creates sort of that diversity and sort of this, uh, that sort of counteracts sort of you having that inflammatory process um, is sort of having that high fiber diet, having sort of a diversity of fruits and vegetables. So apples are great, sort of getting a variety though. So getting sort of changing it up and getting many fruits and vegetables throughout the day, having whole grains, having a diet that is high in fiber. Most people worry about protein, but most people in this country are definitely not deficient in protein, but they are deficient in fiber. Um, so a lot of people are constipated and everybody's bloated and has sort of nausea, vomiting, and usually it's because of their lack of fiber intake. So when I get patients to sort of get on fiber, actually drink water, get rid of those processed foods, it's hard to notice, man, I have more energy. The fogginess is gone. I'm not having the bloating. I'm actually pooping every day. This is amazing. Um, and I don't, and I feel like I completely empty. I'm not having to sit there forever and strain. It's sort of a natural process and that's the goal. It's what we want. And so that's the sort of the longer answer to your question is really, is sort of not having to focus on one particular food because we know just having one food over and over again, doesn't give you a diverse microbiome, which is the goal, but it's really sort of switching up those colors, making things sort of look beautiful when you eat. And so I, how I make my salads at home is I'm um, like, hmm, I don't have any purple here. Let me throw some purple cabbage. I'm missing some orange. Okay. I need some carrots or a yellow bell pepper. And so making things colorful and pleasing to the eye, because from a nerdy perspective, what I know you're getting is more antioxidants. You're getting plenty of vitamin C, vitamin K, you're getting, you know, your calcium, magnesium, you're getting all of these things by just having this prettier plate with a bunch of colors. So for me, it's the nerd piece and you're, I'm, I'm enriching your microbiome, but also you're getting all those micronutrients. So you don't need all of these multivitamins and things that people are taking because you're getting in the form of actual food. You know, around here, we don't think it's nerdy at all. We think it's really cool. Just saying. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, up next, we have Steve. Hey, Steve. Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, thank you. Uh, Doc, young men, 
36 years old, moved back home because of the pandemic, uh, lost a lot of weight originally, uh, went to True North, a lot of successes. Now everybody around them tells me, oh, you did so great. And the weight is creeping back up. Um, probably regained 15 pounds, maybe more so far. At what point are these uh, drugs indicated? Because his general practitioner says, oh, no, you're doing so great. Keep it up. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, common, very, very common. And so I go back to that very first slide and just remembering that it is a chronic disease. It is relapsing, meaning it is going, it comes back no matter how long, you know, when people say once an addict, always an addict, and there is always a process, same thing with food and sort of recognizing that it's that thing will come back around. And so I like to use medications on my patients sort of hit a plateau and especially if they're starting to get a gain, um, but also trying to figure out what happened. Sort of usually sort of, yeah, I can usually pinpoint and find a thing that has occurred that sort of helped to sort of get them to that point. Sort of why, why did they get there? Was it a new medication? Did they start moving less? Did they start to feel more hungry because ghrelin level goes up and makes you more hungry when you lose weight? Um, did they start sort of getting a little bit more processed foods? Was it the fact that they were super, super restrictive, which is how they lost the weight and now it's sort of that was hard to maintain? Is it that we need to change sort of the ratios of their plate a little bit more? Do I need to sort of increase to them having more fiber on the plate? So more servings of fruits and vegetables and reduce servings of sort of that um, like beans or just like a, a smaller amount to so just a fourth of that plate? Do we need to sort of revisit those things to sort of refresh your memory? Because um, you got to have it sometimes. And I'll have patients that sort of are eating a, you know, a healthy diet. They're eating a lot of that healthy diet. Um, and like cultural, we talked about, for example, um, one of my patients um, is from the, uh, where is she from? The PR, um, Puerto Rico. And sort of their culture was that they ate a lot of beans, a lot of legumes. It's great, right? But how much of those beans were we eating? And so and she was eating like a, two cups um, in addition to her grains and all this other stuff. And so all we did was is things that she already liked. We just changed it to where most of her plates were salad. And she was having beans. Yes, I want you to have beans. That's great. That's feeding your microbiome. It's a lot of fiber. It's plant-based protein. I love it. But we're going to change it to a fourth of your plate. We're going to change it to an actual serving, which is a half a cup, which she thought her grandmother like lost it. It was like, oh my God, that's not enough beans. Are you crazy? Um, but changing that ratio was able to help her eat the foods that she enjoyed, feel, still be able to have those bonds with family, but just really reducing those amounts and started to help with that weight loss. So I think it's sort of thinking about A, why did that start? So what changed over that period of time when they started to regain? Um, and then sort of, yeah, being able to make those changes and sort of institute sort of meds as you, as you need for sure. Thanks very much for that, doctor. Um, at the moment, I don't have any other hands raised. We have a few more minutes. I have some questions for you, if that's okay. All right. Um, and uh, if anybody else does have a question, hit your reactions. Well, it looks like Steve has a quick follow-up. Let's jump right in there. Uh, hang on. Hi, Steve. Yeah, he, he rejoined the workforce. And now there's a break room <laughs> with lots of coffee, which he wasn't doing. And, you know, you have coffee, there's Dreamer. loads of donuts. And mm -hmm. comes home and dad says... What'd you do? Nothing. Now, there's a history. Dad used to have this and has other motivating factors that sort of keeps me on the straight and narrow. But he doesn't have these health issues. He's a young guy. And I know there's a donut and there's a cupcake and there's, you know, just enjoy life, Dad. Come on. And uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. I knew it's always something, right? And so what I do in those patients is I try to give patients because 30, like I tell my patients, you're 30 years old, you're 35 years old. To say that you're never going to have a chip again or never have a cupcake or a cookie again is setting yourself up for failure. It's going to happen, right? So my goal is to transition you to sort of some of those healthier versions of those snacks. And so um, don't cringe, but like I give people recipes for chickpea chocolate chip cookies that are super easy to make that are, so they're sort of guilt-free. They taste amazing. And I'm able to fool my godchildren then I can fool anyone. Um, these kids are way too honest, so they will certainly tell you if it's terrible. Um, but it's sort of showing people those easier, those ways to sort of be able to have those snacks. So you don't feel like you're being deprived. So you don't do it every single day. So for that, for those in, in the hospital, it's like the worst place ever because the nurse's station will always be chunked full of cookies and cupcakes and chocolate and the nurses are, come on, doc, how did you have this with us, right? Um, and so that's always going to be there. So I tell patients, you know, we have to figure out a ways around that, right? And so 
having your snack that you bring into work with you that you keep that are kind of stacked there. Um, I give people sort of these cauliflower chips that they love, it's avocado oil chips. So you have those snacks. So if you feel the need that you sort of want or you need those, then you have it available, right? And so to make things super easy, um, my patients who love brownies, so a sweet potato brownie, um, a black bean brownie. And so I tell them just to get over the idea that it's made out of black beans because you won't know it once it's, once it's done. But giving people these other options so they feel like they're in control too. So you have to be able to not feel like you're being deprived, um, which is what I am completely trying to, to avoid in my patients. Um, and feeling like you, you know, you're able to have some of those good things. And what people start to notice is they actually don't, are, don't they will notice over time that they start eating sort of things that are not so sugary and not made with processed stuff that those other things sort of taste way too sweet when you go back to them. Um, and so you don't even like them anymore. I have patients that say, man, I used to love these particular cookies. And now they just they taste I can't even eat one because it's so sweet. And that's the goal to get your body, you're changing your microbiome from the nerdy perspective. I'm changing your microbiome so that you do not crave those things anymore. So you've changed the bugs that are in your gut. So you no longer have created that environment that craves those sort of things. So you don't want them anymore. Um, when I was a resident overnight, um, one of the things that we would do because we were sort of poor residents and there's nothing around, you ate graham crackers and peanut butter and, and Cokes from the nurses stations, you know, from what the patient stashed because that's what you had to keep you up at night. The idea that now is like, I don't know how I did it, but it was sort of a survival <laughs> mechanism. Again, we talk about that nighttime eating too. Um, but those are things that you sort of, once you change your microbiome, you don't crave. And so it's slowly getting him to sort of change his habit, the behavioral piece a little bit to sort of bring in sort of his own thing and keep his little snack pack at work of sort of those unminimally processed simple meals is actually a really good brand. So if you look at the side, they don't have a bunch of that processing stuff that you see in, you know, a chip Ahoy or Oreos. Um, so that's another option I use for, for my people. Thank you so much. My, my wife's a pediatrician. And when she was in residency, she went through the same thing. She lived on diet Coke for two years and all these horrible things that they had just to, just to try to stay awake for yeah. 30 hour shifts. Uh -huh. I know they don't even do that anymore, but yep. um, 30 hour. my mom was like, how do you do a 30 hour shift? There's only 24 a day. I'm like, exactly. So yeah. imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, and the truth is of course that the hospital's got all this food that they should not be serving their patients oh, or, yes, their, or their staff. It's horrible. Um, we have probably less than a minute left and I'm, I'm just curious, uh, you mentioned that a lot of times somebody will go through changes and then they're, they, even if they've lost weight, now they're heading back in the wrong direction again. Obviously so many people talk about that it, it really stems from something emotional. And I, I, again, I understand that that's not exactly your specialty. Do you ever team up with folks that handle that sort of thing to work together in your programs? Yep. Um, we do a lot of referring to local therapists, but most recently we are just partnering to sort of build in sort of, um, weekly therapy sessions for our patients to do group therapy because they all have the same sort of complaints and problems, but they all think they're alone and they're the only one. So they beat themselves up because it must just be me. And so I'm always saying, no, 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 it's not just you. This is everyone. This is a, this is a common thing. And so, yeah, so now we have sort of, we do monthly meditation too, because none of us sit still to enough um, to breathe. And so my idea is to get people to, to really embrace sort of those blue zones, which includes meditation, includes mental health, includes sleeping. So people were like, oh my God, really? Are you really going to start with sleeping and drinking water? Like, come on, where's the hard stuff? Like that is the hard part to get you to sit down and breathe and act actually feel yours, that breath come in and out to slow your heart rate. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, we just recently have been able to, I refer them, but then I realized that people wouldn't go or, but now if it's with me in here, then they're like, oh crap, she's going to know if I don't do it. So they actually do it now. I love that you hold them accountable. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for all of this. Thank you for being so gracious with our audience, with your Q and A uh, uh, session and you're just an extremely thorough presentation. It means so much to, to so many and all of us here. And Dr. Laster, I know I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. So we're going to have our tech team unmute our entire audience. What does everybody want to say to Dr. Laster? Look at Roland. You're so welcome. Thank you.